Hello everyone, welcome to the 39th webinar of the Rus Copernicus project. My name is Georgia Karadimu and in this webinar we will learn how to monitor volcanoes using Sentinel-2 data and more specifically how to trace and monitor the lava flow. We will focus on the Mount Etna volcano and we will check the period from February 2021 until around mid-May 2021. With this webinar, we will complete the RUS webinar series on volcano monitoring. You can check our previous webinars with codes HAZA10 and ATMOS03 to learn how to monitor the volcanic activity with Sentinel-1 data and the volcanic emissions with Sentinel-5P data. I will also let you know about this later, so let's start by having a look at the structure of this webinar. We will first have a quick introduction about the RUS service what this project is about, followed by some updates. We will talk a bit about Sentinel-2 satellite. We will continue with a short introduction about the study area. And then we will move to the exercise in the RUS virtual machine. Finally, a Q&A session will follow at the end. The webinar will last around one to one and a half hour, including both the demonstration part and the Q&A session. Please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and you will be able to repeat this exercise by yourself later once it will be uploaded in our YouTube channel and our training website. In the meantime, you can start sending us your questions as soon as you have one and throughout the webinar and with my colleagues here we will answer to as many of them as possible. The rest of them and those of high interest from everyone, we will discuss them live at the Q&A session. In any case, all of your questions will be answered after the webinar is completed in the relative document that will be uploaded at our training website together with this recording. Okay, let's talk a bit about the RUS service. RUS stands for Research and User Support for Sentinel Core Products. It is an initiative funded by the European Commission and managed by the European Space Agency with the objective to promote the uptake of Copernicus Sentinel data and support research and development activities. The service provides a free and open scalable platform in a powerful computing environment, hosting a suit of open source toolboxes pre-installed on virtual machines, which allow you to handle and process the data derived from the Sentinel satellites. In addition to all that, RUS also provides a specialized user help desk to support your remote sensing activities with Sentinel data and a dedicated training program. Let's talk now a bit more in detail about the training program and the updates of the project. We are offering our services in two main categories based on whether a RUS virtual machine is available to users or not. The first category includes the RUS training activities and the second includes requests coming from individual users and people working on R&D projects. Regarding the training activities, the RUS VMs will be provided to the users as following. For the face-to-face -face trainings and the virtual classroom events, we can accommodate around 20 participants in each one, providing a virtual machine to each one. The type of the VMs will depend on the training category and the ICT team will support you during and after the session for any technical issues you may face. After the event, in case you need to further use the VM, note that you can extend its duration maximum up to one month. Every month, we will continue offering our monthly webinars and the PDF tutorials. We will continue to have them available to everyone via the RUS portal. For those who will receive a VM for replaying a webinar, the availability will not exceed in duration the two weeks. For the external trainings requested, 30 virtual machines maximum will be provided per event and the participants will benefit from the remote support from our ICT team. Moving to the individual users that want to perform any project, the standard RUS VMs provided until recently will not be available anymore, but instead the solution of the Docker container image will be offered. It will contain the RUS virtual environment and our ICT team 
will provide the necessary support for accessing the Docker and installing the selected ROS tools on your own infrastructure. You can find more information about the Docker at the link provided here on the right. So now, here you can see our ROS websites. Here you can find all the information about the project in our ROS portal on the left. So I recommend you to check it after the webinar to get familiar with the service, what it offers, and learn more about the updates of the project. You can register by creating an account, and if you are eligible, you can request the VM, a service. On the right part of the slide, you can see and visit our training page. There, you can find the announcements for our upcoming webinars and events, the recorded videos with the Q&A documents of the webinars delivered so far, and our e-learning material. Over there, by simply creating an account, you can access this material on various topics and practice at your own pace. Every time you repeat a course, a different set of questions appear and you have the chance to learn more. At the end, if you successfully complete the quizzes, you will receive a certificate of completion. In case you face any difficulty while signing up, please contact us. As I have mentioned in the beginning, we also have our YouTube channel, the Rus Copernicus Training, where you can find all the videos of our previous webinars and you will also find this one in a few days. Okay, now let's pass to some information about Sentinel-2 satellite. For this exercise, we will be using optical data provided by Sentinel-2 satellite constellation. Sentinel-2 mission carries a passive sensor, which means it observes an object of the Earth's surface using external energy sources, like the sunlight. It is formed by a constellation of two twin satellites, Sentinel-2A and 2B, and they are passing at a polar orbit, meaning that they complete four circles around the Earth, passing always from the North and South Poles. They are also phased at 180 degrees to each other, and the multispectral instrument it carries has 13 spectral bands. The spatial resolution varies based on spectral band to 10, 20 or 60 meters. At the equator, it has a revisit time of 5 days. As you can see here, the 13 spectral bands are in frequencies of the visible, near-infrared and short-wave infrared parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Those that are of pixel size of 10 meters resolution are four, bands two, three, four, and eight. And there are those which we will use also for this exercise, together with the bands 11 and 12, that are of 20 meters resolution and in the short wave infrared. Finally, the product types that are available to users are level 1C and level 2A. We will work with level 2A data in this case. Now we can visit our study area. We will visit the Etna volcano. Mount Etna is one of the three active volcanoes in Italy and one of the most active in the world. It has almost a constant state of activity. It is a stratovolcano located on the east coast of Sicily and more specifically at the province of Catania. Parts of the volcano are shared among different local municipalities and this is actually the largest volcano in Italy, covering an area of around 1,190 square kilometers, and it also is one of the tallest active volcanoes in Europe. Currently, it is of height 3,326 meters, and as you know, Etna's eruptions are of multiple patterns. They can be either flank or occur at the summit, which has five density craters, and here is where you can see them. There are also plenty of vents that provide relevant material systematically, and this volcano is known for many eruptions. With the volcanic activity, we have firstly started taking place at about half a million years ago. There has been an increase in at the eruptive events recorded the last few years, and the most recent summit eruptions have started in February 2021. 
The city of Catania has been affected by this recent event, mainly by the volcanic ash that covered most of the area. Mount Etna lies above the convergent plate margin between the African plate and the Eurasian plate. The African continental plate is constantly moving towards Europe and subducts underneath the Eurasian plate. In the image here on the left, we see the thrust tectonics prevailing the Italian peninsula and its surroundings. In the next image, we see a digital elevation model from 2015 of the summit area of Mount Etna with outlines of the areas affected by the, at that time, recent lava covers. You can see the various numbers slash years around the map, and within brackets, under the names of the craters, you can see their age. I have also written them here. I have written the age of the five main craters, from the oldest to the most recent. The grey-grey areas that we have uh, in the picture are characterized by uncertainties. So, we could be talking for a long time about this volcano, but let's pass now to the Rich Virtual Machine to start our exercise. So, this is the link for the Roost desktop. We insert here our credentials, username and password, and we log in. Once we are connected, this is our environment. Here you can see that we have some uh, different software already installed. The folders, here we have the terminal in case we need it. And I think we should ideally, before we go to Snap, to show how to process the data, we should open the Firefox so that we download the images we need for this exercise. So, I will show you how to search and download images from the Open Access Hub that we have all the Copernicus data. We go in this website and we just click on Open Hub. Once we are there, we can go up here on the right and we click Login. We insert our username and password. In case you don't have an account yet, you just sign up, you create your account, and then you come back and you log in. So I log in with my account. And once this is successful, I navigate over the area of interest. In our case, we said that we need to go to Mountain Etna, which is located here. What we will do is we will create a small area to search, not very large, and once we find some data, I will show you some tips on how to find more efficiently the data you need. So we select here the navigation mode and we draw with our mouse a small area. Now we go up here on the left in these three lines and we insert the period we want to search. In our case, we want to find all the available images from February 2021 until now, May 2021. But just to make it a bit simpler and easier, I will insert as period to search only the month of February, otherwise we will have too many results. So to start with, I click here and I go on 1st of May, sorry, 1st of February 2021 until 28 February 2021. I go further down and I select the Mission Sentinel 2 because this is the one we want to use and the product type to be of level 2 and we select this S2 MSI 2A. We just leave it like that and we click search and then I will show you some more details while you search data. These are the results and here we can see some um, different images covering the area. Let me take, for example, this one, which is acquired on the 28th of February. If I click here on View Product Details, as soon as I click, I see that this is selected here in the center. This window appears, and here on the left, you can see the footprint, which is the area it covers, and also you can have a quick look of the, of the area. For example, if we want to select an area which has no clouds, 
either we set this parameter on the search uh, area or we see here the quick look and see if it is covered by clouds or not. In this case, if we want to download products that are in this area, and here you can see the mountain, so it is covering our part, you just go a bit further down, and if you click on the product among all the other information it has, you will find that it is writing relative orbit start 36. This is a number you need to keep if you want to search all the images that are passing over that area and are of this form. So keep this number 36 and we can go and close that now that we got the information. Alternatively, what else we can do? We can go and check, for example, this one of 26 February and we can check the details and we see that this is the other one which is on the western part. You see the area it covers. Again, this one has no clouds. And if we go down to the product, we will find the information which is 79 relative orbit start. So we keep these two numbers, 36 and 79. What I would like to do is I would like to go back to the search and check the following. Once I'm here, as I said, you can specify here the cloud cover. For example, if you want your image to have from 0 to 2, from 0 to 5, here you see 0 to 9.4 percent cloud coverage, so that if an area is having more than that in clouds, uh, just when you search, you do not get these results. But in our case, we don't want to do that. First of all, because we want to have everything over the area, even the images with the clouds, so that I will show you later why. And secondly, because imagine if you want to work with these large images and you have on this western part a lot of clouds. If you just set and say, I want my image to be relatively cloud free and have uh, and has to have very little clouds then this uh, image will probably be eliminated from the results even though it will be suitable for what you need on this small part up here so in this case we don't set anything no restrictions for cloud coverage but what we can do is we can go here to the relative orbit number and set as a start 36 and when I click search you will see that the results I will get for February will be only this area and this is what we need we can easily download them again remember that we also want the images available from the other pass so we go back and we insert here the 79 and we search again and these are the results so what we can do if we want to download all these images you just click on the download icon here download product and once you do it automatically starts to being downloaded but what happens with these images that we need and you see here that it says offline these belong to the long-term archive and you need to retrieve them so you just click on the download icon and you get this message saying offline product retrieval initiated this product goes into the cart and you need to go and check after a while when this will be available note that if you have an account you cannot really request many products at once you need to have around a couple of hours between requests and per account there is a limitation so you just click OK you just wait and if you go here in your profile in the cart you will see that the, odd, the product that you have requested is in here you don't get any notification when this is online so you just need to go manually and check and download the product once this gray area will be removed and the offline will be disappeared. But 
In this case, I just show you how to, to search data for February. In this case, we wanted to have data for February, March, April, and May. They seem to be quite a lot of uh, products. So what I will do is the following. I will not use anymore the Copernicus Open Access Hub, and instead I will use a different platform. I will use the Creadias. So I go, I open a new tab, and here I have already the Finder Creodias, and I go immediately to this one. Again, you can have a look if you want in our YouTube channel. We had a webinar in October 2020 about how to access the data in the Copernicus um, Data Access Sci-Hub and the DS services, and Creodias is one of the five DS services. So you can go there and find analytically all the information on how to register, how to create an account, how to log in, and search and download the data you need. In this case, I have already created my account, so I just log in. And now I can search the data I want. So there are multiple ways to do so, but I will not explain it now, as we have already dedicated another webinar. And what is important for you now is to follow these steps. Let me first open a folder to show you where we have our data. So if we go to the shared in the Rus virtual machine, depends where you have your data stored. If we go in the training, has a 11 monitoring, sorry, has a 11 volcano monitoring Etna. You can see that I have some files in here with auxiliary data, the export, original, and processing. First of all, I will open the auxiliary data folder and I will open this file that says Sentinel-2 names dates. So this file here, I have all the images listed from 1st of February 2021 until 24th of May 2021. And I also have here some notes. So these images that uh, are full of clouds, so you cannot really see anything happening in the area, while the rest of them are cloud free and you can work. In total, over the area, every two, three days, we had 46 images and 26 of them were cloud free. What you can do in this case, instead of searching the area and trying to find which images to download, you can take this information and you can go and, for example, when you select this image, this name, you just right click, copy, and you go back to the finder and you paste this information in the product identifier or path. Once you have that paste, you click on search and immediately you get this result. This is the image we want. You can see the percentage of the cloud, 70%. As we said, it's full of clouds. We knew it. I have it already noted. You click on that and here you get some information and some details. Then you just click download and the product is being downloaded. You repeat the same for the rest of the data. If you do not want to download the images that are covered from clouds, which I recommend you not to, you just take the rest of the images, the rest names, and you download them. So, when the images are downloaded, make sure that you go and you put them in the correct folder, which is here, this original. In here, I have them separated by month, second, third, fourth, and fifth month of the year. So now that we have everything downloaded, we can close this browser and we can go and open Snap to start showing our processing. We double click. Snap is the software that has been developed for processing mainly Sentinel data, but it can also process data from other missions. So when we open it, 
we get these windows. For those who are not familiar, everything we work on has to be here in the Product Explorer. We load here all the data and step by step I will show you how to really use this interface. So, the first thing we have to do is load the data. So, If we go to the original folder and we click, for example, on February, we have them here. Ideally, I would suggest you to load them one by one in chronological order. For example, first I take the first one of February, then I take the 3rd of February, and it goes on like that. But I don't want to spend more time now trying to load each one manually. I have already saved a session so that I have them already loaded at the correct sequence. So I go here in the file, session, open session, and I open this. Here I have all the images, and if I click on the first one, for example, I can see that it contains some information in here, some metadata that are useful, index codings, vector data. It has all the bands, remember? I mentioned that each Sentinel-2 product has 13 spectral bands, which are here, and here it also has some masks. From all these, we will focus on the bands. So let me show you, for example, I will open two products just to make it faster. In the tutorial, I have opened all of them and you can see all the comparisons. For example, as we said, the activity started in February. I will just open, for example, this image here on February 18. And in order to visualize it, I right click on it and I click on Open RGB Image Window. So over here, I have some profiles available. And I choose the natural colors one, where we have bands 4, 3 and 2. I click OK. And this is what we see in this area. So here we have the view window. And on the left, we have the navigation area that if I click, for example, this one, it goes to the full zoom in the image. I can zoom in and out. I can go to the color manipulation and check what is happening in each band of the green, of the red, green and blue. And also I have the world map. So if I just zoom in here, I can see the location of these images on the map. Okay, apart from this image that I have opened, I will open also the next one. Right click, open RGB and OK. And this is the result. I have these two images open, for example, and if I go here in window tile horizontally, for example, I have them in parallel. Now, if I go back to navigation and I have these two options selected, it synchronizes the views and the cursor positions. You can see here on the left which is the area it covers. So I just click here, zoom all, and I have both of them in parallel. What did we say? We said that the area of interest we want is up here, is a small area. So to start with, since we cannot really understand what is happening and we see quite a lot of clouds, what we want to do is we want to create a subset because we don't need all this area. So if we zoom in, in both of them, we will see that over here is the area that is for interest for us, which is the volcano. How do we create a subset? There are two ways. The one is once you are here, you just right click and you select special subset from you and it is cutting, subsetting this area. And the other one is you can go and take up here a, a drawing tool. You can draw over here the area that you want. 
you take here the selection tool, you select the polygon, you right click and you select well-known text from geometry. And here you have this polygon with this information. You take that, you copy it, you click OK, and you go for example, here I have it all ready for you in the auxiliary data, and you paste it somewhere. And here it is. Now we want to perform this step to subset all these images for over the same area at once, and we have quite a lot of images. How do we do that? We need, first of all, in order to subset it so that we can afterwards use them, we need to have all the bands to be on the same resolution. Remember, bands 2, 3, 4 and 8 are in 10 meters resolution, while some others are in 20 and 60. We would like to use also the bands 11 and 12, which are in 20 meters resolution, but we cannot make combinations between bands of two different um, types of resolution. So, firstly, we need to resemble them so they are all in the same reference, meaning that when you take a band from the 20 meters and you break it, if I can say that, to 10 meters resolution, you just have this information distribute it in a way that the software will have the same references. And the same as well, when you go from the 10 meters to the 20, you just distribute it in a different way. It's not that the information itself it is changing, that you increase or you decrease the actual information behind. So, we need to build a graph where we first will resemble all the bands so that they have the same resolution and secondly we will subset the area because we do not need to use all these large images. We go up here and we select the graph builder and in this window we have the read and the write operator. Down here you also see that there are two tabs its tab refers uh, to its operator added on this part. Just to be sure that no mistakes will be made, we right-click on the right and we delete it and we will add it later. So, first of all, right-click, go to Add, Raster, Geometric, Resample, and you just go here on the left and you take this red arrow, you click, you drag it towards resample, you leave it, and this connects the graph. Next, you right click, you go to raster, geometric, subset, again the same. And finally, we add again from the input output the right operator. And here it is. Now, Having created this graph, which we will apply to all the images, we will not go down here to the tabs, we will not set any parameter, because we will need to run this graph uh, in one way for all the images and make it fast. We just go and save it, and in this case, I went to the shared training has a level Volcano Monitoring Etna in the processing folder and I just named this graph, I have it already saved, resample subset graph XML and I click save. This is saved so now we can close the graph builder and we go now to this one which is the BATS processing. What does it do? So first of all we need to deselect this option of key to, we don't want it to keep the source product name. What we do is in this uh, tab of the parameters, for example, if I want to process all the images from February that I have over here, if you click this icon, add opened, it will add all the images that are here in the product explorer. And here, if you click refresh, you will have all the information of the type of the image, the acquisition, and the track. 
The images are loaded. You can now load the graph that you had just created before. So we go, we navigate to the path, we have it saved, and we select the graph and we click OK. And the tabs we had created appear over here. So now it is time to set the parameters. We go to the example one, and in our case, we will select to have them all the bands resampled in 10, 10 meters resolution. If you want, you can have it in 20. This is a matter of what you want to apply. In this case, we go in the beginning to define the size of the resampled product. We want it to, resembled, to resample it by reference band from the source product, meaning that we select the band 2, 3, 4, 8, whichever band is on 10 meters resolution and all the rest bands will be resampled to this one. For the rest information it has, we leave them as they are. And now we go to subset. These are all the source bands. You can see that they, they are quite a few. But since we just wanted to make it faster, simpler, and we just need the information of the natural colors and of two bands of the short wave infrared, what we will do is we will select, we will click band 2, we will keep the control selected, and we will select band 3, 4, 8, and also band 11 and 12. This way, this will be the only bands that we'll have as output. If you want more bands, if you need all of them, for example, or any other combination, either you select none and all of them automatically are being processed, or you select manually those that you need. So, apart from subsetting this way, subsetting which bands we want to be processed, we also need, if you remember, to set the area of interest. We need only this small area we set before. So we click on the geographic coordinates. If again I zoom in, in here, you see the location of the image over the globe. And if we go here that we have that saved, that we have done it before, and you copy it, you go down here in this area, right click and paste it, and you just click update. And in here you see that another small yellow area has been created. This is the area that we will subset. And finally, if we go to the right tab, you see that we have the name. It has the subset in the beginning, resampled at the end, and you choose here the directory you want to save it. In this case, I went again to the shared training HAZA 11, and in there I went to the processing, you can select your own directory. I went to the February and I selected it, and now it is ready. So, now we can just click Run, and it will start processing all the 12 images at once. And when they are ready, they will be appeared here on the left in the Product Explorer window. I will not run it now, just to save some time. So let me show you, after we have done this processing, how the results look like. Okay, let me load that. And it is this one. So, I will open again, as I did before, the images of 18 February and of 20 February. So, the session is being restored. It is opening here the products. So, I right-click on this product so before I right click on that, if I open this product, I see that it contains this information. It's a bit less information than we had before. And if I open the bands now, it has only these six bands that I have selected in the processing before. Now I can right click on that and open an RGB image window. And this is it. You see that it is way smaller and it is centered and focused over the volcano. Let me also open the other one of the 21st. 
and let me put them in parallel. Okay, what do we see here? Do we see something that we don't really understand very well? We see some clouds, obviously, in the area. And we see here, if I can say on this right image, we see some smoke, if this can be smoke from the volcano. And we also see this white area, which we're not sure exactly what this is. Can it be volcanic ash? Can it be snow, maybe? Why did we do the resampling before? Because, as we said, we want to use the bands 11 and 12 that are in short wave infrared. And why is this useful? It is very useful because band 11 is meant to be available for defining different soil types. And also, with bands 11 and 12, we can sense and detect the lava, which is warmer than the area, and also we can separate which area is snow, which area is ash. So these are the natural colors, which, for example, if I go here on the color manipulation and I enhance all this information, if I move this one towards here, so I just have a more clear image, if I can say that, not so dark. This is what we see in natural colors. So we have obviously the clouds. We have this white area, which we don't know what it is, but we do not see any lava flowing. Why? Because the color of the lava is dark as well, and it is here, we just do not really understand it. So what I will do I will close, for example, yeah, this one. I will enhance the 18, as I did before. I will enhance a bit all the bands. And now that I have this information, I will go and I will take this image and I will create another RGB. Right-click, open RGB image window. And instead of using these bands, 4, 3, and 2, I will select another combination. I will select the false color urban, which is using the bands 12, 11, and 4 in this sequence, in these channels. And if I click OK, and I go to Window, Tile Horizontally to have them in parallel, this is what I get. So, what do we see here? It's exactly the same image, it's just giving us totally different information. And in this case, we can see that all these red parts that you see is the lava that is flowing, that is really hot. Which we could not see it exists here, it is not just of this color. So we ask it in the red band to have, the in the red channel, sorry, to have the band 12 so that we can see this area. You can also see that there is some activity going on in the other craters of the area. You see these colors. And we can now see that all this blue area that we have here is actually the snow of the area. So, what we want to do is to take for all the images we have, now I have processed the February. I have also processed, I have also processed March April and May. And what we need to do is when we are at this stage, we right click and we open the false color image of bands 12, 11 and 4 and we can very easily trace and monitor the lava. Up to this part, I can say that we have completed most of the processing and what we want to do is to take this information, export it, and put it in a GIS environment or put it in Google Earth. When you have this information and you want to export it in a QGIS, sorry, in a GIS, in this case QGIS, you just select the product and you go to File, Export, GeoTIFF. 
you select where you want to save it. In our case, we want to save it in HASA 11 processing, sorry, HASA 11 export geotiff for QGIS. More specifically, I have a folder for February. So, what do you export? You can go to subset. You can subset the area even more if you want. You can subset it by bands, for example. You can subset to have this view only the bands 12, 11, and 4. So you keep selected only these three bands that you want. And in the metadata, you just select none. When you have that and you click OK, you have a file name, you have the geotiff, and you click Export Product. If you want to export this one that we have in the right with natural colors, when you go in the subset, in the band subset, you select only the bands 4, 3, and 2. And this way you have the result. OK, and then you export them. But what if you want to export that and use it in Google Earth? If you go, for example, in File, Export, Other, View as Google Earth KMZ, you get this message saying that the product must be in geographic lat long projection. So what we need to do is we need to reproject it. We click OK, no problem. And we go again and we build a graph. I delete again the right operator. Where we right click, we'll go to Add, Raster, Geometric, Reproject. And we connect it to the read. And then we add the output. Again, we save this graph in the processing folder and I have it named Reprojection Graph. And you click Save. The graph is created. So again, once more, you go to the batch processing, you deselect the Keep Source product name, you load all the images that you want to reproject, which in this case happens to be in the Product Explorer window, and you load the graph which is this one. These are the tabs, and in the reproject, you make sure that here in the projection you have the geographic lat long WGS84, which is the one that Google Earth can understand. Just remember to deselect this part that says reproject type point grids. Again, you go in the right one, and you select where you want them to be exported. In this case, again, I have them in the HAZA 11 processing 02. And you select it. And you run it, and it is applying for all of them, this reprojection, and it's loading the information on the Product Explorer window. Just let me load them so that we don't lose time again. And it is this one. There is no difference basically in, in the final result. It's the same information. It's just in a different coordinate system so that you can use it for the different uh, software purpose that you need. And as you can see, now that we have them here, if I open again, for example, this one, and I open a natural color image, it is exactly the same information. If I open again a false color image with bands 12, 11, and 4, and put them together, we can see that it is the same information. Now you can go and export them. And I can just show you a faster way for exporting them. You can just, when you have the view opened, you can just right click on that and select Export View as Google Earth KMZ. You go where you want to export them, in this case, in the Export KMZ for Google Earth, in this one, and you can name them the, the way you want. 
In this case, for example, I have this one name, 2021-0218, and I have here the combination of the bands that I want to export. You click Save, and the results are exported. I showed you how to process the images, and I was just giving you an example of what is happening for February. But as I mentioned, we have done this processing for March, April, and May as well. What I have created for you before we leave from SNAP is I have created a session where I have all the images for this time period that are cloud-free. So, as I mentioned, we have 46 images in total in the area and 26 of them are cloud-free. I will open them now and I will open all the RGB images in this false color and we'll put them in order so that you see them and see how they look like in sequence. And later, when we finish with Google Earth and QGIS, I will show you the animation that I have created to see the whole timeline of the images. I go one by one. You see here we have 26. I right click, I open the RGB image. And as you can see, one by one, all the images that have no clouds will be created. So let me put them in order and show you how all of them look like. And I just go to Window, Tile Evenly, and I will see them all in a sequence. And this is a result. And if I click here in Zoom All, we can see what is happening in the area in, over the volcano from the very first date, from the very first cloud-free image we have in 3rd of February until the last one that we have in the 24th of May. So here you can see that if we zoom in a bit more, we see that there was some activity in the craters. There used to be some indications that the, vo the volcano is active. And as the time passes, we see that this becomes stronger and stronger. And here we have the lava flowing. And you can see how it continues. We have a bit of a break. The volcano is getting rest a bit. But if you notice, if we zoom in, we can see here more in detail that there is still a lot of lava flowing. Again, then we had another event with lava being, uh, with the volcano being more active. You see how this continues. We have some small uh, periods that the lava is not that much compared to previous ones. In all of them, we have activity happening. You can see that not only this southeast crater, the new southeast crater was giving lava, but also the other craters were obviously very active. You see how this evolves. We had the period that uh, the volcano was quite calm, if we can say that. And then again, in May, it started giving us some new um, events happening. And you can see that from a few days ago, 19th of May, we have lava flowing again, but this time it's just going to a different direction. So you can see that it started, we had the lava flowing both towards east and towards west, then we had only towards east, and then with this new case that we have, from May and on, the lava is mainly flowing towards the west. So this is the general overview. I will show it better to you later in the animations. Let me now close SNAP, that you have seen what is happening over the whole area. And more in detail, I will open QGIS and show you what we have just 
export it in this one. So here I have already created the session to make it a bit faster. Just to let you know, in case you want to load in QGIS your data, there are several ways. One easy way is you go to the folder that you have exported your GeoTIFF files. And when you are there, you just click on it and you drag it and you drop it here on the left on the layers panel. So now I have them already loaded. And I have opened for you the image from February 3rd. Let me just go here to the Open Layers plugin and add a background. I will just put it lower at the end of all these images so that we have it like that. And I will, for example, here zoom in over this area that we have, that we mainly want to focus, sorry, like that. And let me now, I will go image by image of the cloud free ones, this white you see, you just know, and we will see how the area looks like. So this is on February 6, 11, 16, 18, that we have the lava flowing, 21, 23, 26, 28. Now we go to March 3rd. We see that it starts cooling down a bit. We continue March 8th. We have some clouds, but you can still see, if you check more carefully, we can still see under these um, thin clouds, the lava that is flowing and also the spots of the other craters. So if we continue, we go on March 25th after the 8th, because the rest of March is full of clouds. Again, we see the lava flowing. You can see in these lower parts on the eastern side, we see some lava, but it's not that hot compared to this one closer to the crater. Then we go 30 of March that we have these remnants, if I can say that, of lava. We don't really have new material coming out. And now we pass to April. Again, we see some lava coming out. April 2nd, April 9th. You see the area, 12th. We don't really see here, we should have enhanced the data before exporting it. We have on 14th, we don't really see now a lot of activity happening. We see some craters having something, but we don't really have new lava flowing from this crater that we are studying today. And we continue in April on 17, nothing really is happening. We have then 10 days full of clouds and we go to the 27th of April, but again, we start seeing that there is some more uh, higher activity, if I can say that, in the area. We continue 29th, seems quite calm, but then we move to May and we see in May 9th that lava is starting to flow again. We continue on the 12th, on the 17th, and then when we go to 19th of May, you see this lava that uh, has already been in this western side. And we keep going up to the 22nd, which here you can see some colors in the area, which is just a warmer area. We cannot, sure, uh, we cannot be sure and understand really that this is new lava. It's just warm. And finally, the last image that we have of the 24th of May. Apart from that, okay, we have this information, but apart from that, what else can we get? If we go, let me keep open, for example, the image of 18 of February, which we had this quite strong, if I can say that, quite a lot of lava. 
If I go here, I have already for you in the auxiliary data, I have contour lines. I have the contours of every 20 and 100 meters. So if you go here, you can see this detail and see this uh, information with red color are the contours of 100 meter. And if you zoom in and out in the most appropriate way, you will see that in general, in the area, you have a lot of control lines that are closed. Because this means that are mainly areas that we have some other small vents, craters, that uh, fissures, lava is flowing. And you can get a lot of information about the topography of the area. If you click in each one of them, you can have also here, if you take this tool, Identify Features, you can have also the information, if we zoom in a bit more, of what is its contour about. So here you can see the details of the contours. Apart from that, if uh, I remove them so that we have a relatively light and empty map, if I remove them, I have created for you a shape file named LavaFlow. So if I load it, you can see that here we have, for all these 26 images, we have the shape file of each one, and it is showing the area that has been covered by lava that has been detected from Sentinel to Satellite. If I right click on that and I go to properties, over here, if I select instead of single symbol, if I select categorized, we select here in the column the ID. We want to classify them by ID, which means by different date. And we have here random colors and we classify it. We get for its value that is on the lesson. So for each different date, we have a different color. If we click OK, we can see them here and we can get information and monitor and see each date, uh, which was uh, the lava, which was the extent of the lava. And we have already calculated that. We right click on that. We open the attribute table and we see here the ID number and we see the area in square meters that correspond of the lava detected that day by the satellite. For example, as I have here opened the 18th of February, which was the day that we had quite a lot of lava compared to other days. This is in square uh, meters. So if we make this in square kilometers, it is around 1.86 square kilometers, the total area that had been covered by lava. And this is uh, some information you can get when you have a, a geographical a, a GIS environment. You can also add more information. You can add data, uh, seismic data, any other data that is of interest for you. And you can process these uh, results. Let me now just um, close QGIS so that I show you very quickly uh, the same results we have exported in Google Earth. So here we have Google Earth and we open it. Okay. So it is loading now. And I have already for you here, uh, I have exported the RGB images with bands 12, 11, and 4. And again, here I have the contour lines. I have here uh, on the left the list of all this information, but we do not really need to load all of them. I will simply open again, as I did before, the 18th of February. And here you can see this image in 3D. So if I just move a bit, you can also see here in detail that we can even see the crater.
the moment it is actually having the lava flowing from it. So you see here, if we just zoom in here, and also the other craters that are having some activity. So you can just see the detail of how well this is depicted in Google Earth. And on the top of that, I can also add, as I did before, I can add the contours of 20 meters as a start, so that you see how they look like, and also of the 100 meters. In case you want to remove the 20 and you leave only this purple of 100, and you see the distribution of the area in terms of topography. We can go like that as we are now and I can load, for example, the next image we have, which is on 21st February. Then we can continue and go to the 23rd of February and so on. You see that February was the month that we had the highest activity. And we can go like that and see everything, but instead of spending time and doing it now, uh, I will show it to you as I promised in the presentation that I have. Just let me close this one. And let me remind you that here, that you have in this folder, if you request a virtual machine, you will have the kit which will have these folders of auxiliary data, export original in processing. You will have to download the original data by yourself. Just remember that in the auxiliary data, you will find the Sentinel-2 names dates file, where you have it here. And instead of looking for the images one by one, you can just copy from here the names and search them and download them the way I showed you before. And also you can have the contour lines of 20 and 100 meters for both QGIS and for uh, Google Earth. Plus here you will have all the, the Google Earth files that I have exported from the data I processed for every month in the RGB images of 12, 11 and 4 bands. Okay, let me move to the presentation. We have already seen in QGIS and Google Earth the results, but let's see them now all together in these animations I have created for you. So in this first one, as you can see, we have all 46 images available over the Mount Etna that have been used for this exercise. We see how the volcano looks like from space with Sentinel-2 data from February until May 2021. You can also see these long periods that uh, the area was full of clouds, mainly in April and May, also some days in March, and we could not really see the lava flowing underneath them. So in the next one, I, had, I kept only 26 images that were relatively cloud-free, and we can see the areas that have been covered by the lava that is constantly flowing, with only a few small breaks during this period. So, I think that now that we have seen uh, everything, we have a good overview of how to monitor the lava flowing. And if you have any questions that have arised, please save them for a while for the Q&A session. Let me tell you again that you can repeat this exercise by your own if you want to practice or adapt the methodology to your own application. And in order to repeat the exercise, go to the Roos portal, register and apply for a virtual machine. During that process, you just need to specify the training code has 11 once needed. You will receive the training kit that contains the PDF of the step-by-step -step guide and the auxiliary data. Also, if you simply want to download the PDF of the tutorial, you can go to the Roos portal and under the RUS library menu, click on Train with RUS, select the Risk Monitoring tab, and you will find the HAZ11 tutorial uploaded. This was all from my side. Here you can see 
um, where you can reach us. If you have any questions, thank you very much for joining and I will now give you a couple of minutes to post your questions and I will be back to you for the Q&A session. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for attending and have a nice day.